Welcome. This is the October 4th Jail and Zones call. We have Dave, Dan, Florian, Jan, Jamie, and myself, Michael. Others are trickling in. Garan has just landed. Welcome. Uh, Jamie, having missed you last week, do you have any updates, particularly relating to the 14 data release? I snuck the uh, one thing into the rc.d that looks for the includes. Oh, nice. Yeah. To make that not break. So that is the last thing that I plan on have 14 having. Uh, that's the one we all concluded needed to happen. So thank you for doing that. Any questions from the group? And were there any issues on, uh, let's see. Can you um, drop a link? Uh, and uh, did you manage to uh, write something up for the release notes? to tell people about uh, includes and how they work and when the old logic is disabled. So, really. Um, yeah, the really first thing I did, I have not done anything for that. It's just a, uh, the, the man page thing is he only mentioned the feature. Yeah. Well, some of us here may read uh, about the changes in the man directory uh, using git or something uh, i think that's a major um, minority solution and <laughs> yeah uh is that something you'd like to handle or should someone try to do that on your behalf maybe get reach out to release engineering and get something in the release notes that's a pretty cool feature just saying well i could look at it I don't know. I, I didn't even, you know, I've never put a thing in the release notes once, not even when I did the original jail work. Oh, okay, well, hey. Well, my original jail work. Better late than never. But mm -hmm. thank you so much for getting that in. Let's see, Goran, are you up to an update on JLNV list? I saw a post on the Fediverse that you've got some news, and Dan is like, hey, that sounds interesting. Mm. Um, yeah, well... Um... Well, to give you just a little bit of background, uh, editing and filtering any list is complex because editing is removing element and adding a new one, which also changes uh, order in uh, array, which is nice to think. Uh, filtering can be uh, slow because Analyst is implemented using fail queue. It's so implemented using what? It's called fail queue. Hmm. Can you drop that in chat? It's, of course. It's part of... Um, give me a sec. It's part of this man page. Awesome. Okay, cool. Thank you. Continue. So <clears throat> it's a linked list, or if you don't know what it is, uh, imagine an array. It's appropriate for what I'm going to describe. Uh, the filtering can, uh, is tricky or complex if you have a lot of uh, attributes then uh, partial get and partial set can be really lengthy. And uh, complexity is n squared, which is really, really bad. And using something like a tree, r, b, underscore, whatever, uh, a set of macros, and basically TLQ also uses uh, just a different structure, it's a tree. And it's a well-balanced tree. So searching is logarithmic. And it enables us to even have edits in place. We don't have to remove and reinsert the element. So I think it's going to be a better structure and I implemented a native, how to say, native types. Uh, and I'm working on a method so that 
like envylist can contain an envylist under some attribute. And then I'm going to implement arrays. I think uh, envylist are good for messages between processes or kernel and process, but are cumbersome for storing and editing. That's why I started work on this. And uh, yeah, nice thing about the structure I'm working on is that it also has pack and unpack, and it will pack and unpack uh, to a format that every list uses. So no binary, well, there is a binary compatibility with every list. Uh, the problem we face with analyst as a storage is that, uh, well, with, with editing, and the problem with any other structure is that you would have to convert it to analyst, then analyst to a blob that's, uh, that's passed around. So you would have to convert twice. That's, that's really nasty. And this way, I'm hoping to merge the best of both worlds. Uh, it will support everything analyst supports, plus we will have editing and uh, structure that we, we kind of know already because the RB, uh, RB stands for red black. Uh, it's a type of tree. And uh, family of macros to work with such a tree starts with RB underscore and then whatever the macro is. Uh, is the same way to tell Q. So the tell Q is used for arrays, and RB tree is used for for the the parameters. Uh, I call it parameters type. And um, uh, why I say that we already know how to work with it, it's a macro, it's a set of macros uh, really widely used throughout the FreeBSD. So uh, as Jan put it in the last meeting, it's battle tested. So the only thing that I implementing in the structure or implement adding is a name which is a uh, string and uh, value type which is kind of special. It's a union which means that only one segment of memory is used for all variables. And if you're not careful, you will shoot yourself in the foot. But it's saved on the memory footprint, and if we later add more uh, variables to it, fields, nothing will change unless the new type we're adding is bigger than 64 bits, which is really, really rare. So, yeah, then I think. I want to explore, well, I'm sure I want to explore uh, how to implement something like analyst pack and unpack. Uh, I think we're, in the end, we will be ready for uh, storing what envylist communicates. What's that last word, envylist? Uh, what uh, envylist communicated okay. as a message. So my idea is also to have a C++ and Python implementation of Envelist, but not for now. I want to learn on C and then uh, then build upon that knowledge for those two languages. Any questions from the group? Um. Just some some comments. Uh, he's been uh, working and showing me some code with this, and 
I am becoming less convinced that EnvyList is what we want to be using um. due to its having its own namespace apart from the jail parameter namespace and the fact that EnvyList would be used for message passing, but then it's not useful for actually storing things in the kernel. So things just have to be converted to and from EnvyList. It, it doesn't seem to, and okay, and the third one, the fact that we have to deal with the different EnvyList types. I, I think this is adding more complication than it's worth. But that is exactly the reason why I'm implementing this structure. It's communicating via stream of bytes with EnvyList, but in the kernel, we don't have to have EnvyList at all. Right. I have something uh, of an observation to share, but which is relevant to this, but I would like to keep it part of my report on the state notification stuff. that I'm working on. Okay. Uh, uh, Jamie, I just have a suggestion. Let yes. me finish the structure and let me uh, create a branch or something on GitHub and it shows how I think it should be used. And if we don't like it, okay, let's discuss it then and see what we are going to do. But I really, really want to implement this structure because at least for my projects, I know I will be using it. Oh, okay. It sounds like this is useful outside of jail, correct? Yes. Well, we won't well, stop we you. Won't stop Someone is that cool. <laughs> um, let's see. Dave and uh, perhaps Dan, any questions for Goran? I know you've had interest in his work in various ways. And well, I'm I'm positive this isn't going in soon. This is a long term plan, something for mid FreeBSC fourteen or something. I can't see this going into FreeBSC thirteen. Oh, sorry, fourteen. Am I understanding? your your time window here you mean is it going to be for 14 or 15 yeah it's going to be 15 yeah uh, i don't have much time so i'm yep. working on it in my spare one yeah yeah nothing else is going in 14 unless we discover a bug or you know have Very a bug that we've already job. discovered like some of these uh jailbreak things that we discover a solution to in time but yeah new features mm -hmm. no new features has there been any progress on the escapes none at all okay so, so just uh, any progress on the on the witch there were some escapes that you'll see a few meetings back oh yes yes yeah, sorry perhaps we are no worries. I, I didn't hear that i didn't hear the word yeah. No worries. So, uh, Dave, you had something. Goran's, um, Goran's things here. I think there's um, a couple of pieces. I wrote a, um, a Lua, uh, the other side of it, a piece to talk from Lua and unpack and pack envy lists on that side. Um, and it's much nicer to work with compared to the IOVEC stuff. Not enormously nicer, but nicer. And from my perspective, I can see how this would be useful in general across um, – you know, all of FreeBSD, not specifically jails. However, for jails, the thing we wanted to fix by using this was the ability to add um, generic metadata. And it gave us a really nice key value pair where on the kernel side, we just store a blob and what you put in the blob is your problem. Um, but from outside, what we know that's in the blob is this key value pair structure. Um, and it looks like the problem we uh end up with is that going in and out of the kernel um each time when someone makes a change or reads the parameters we have to pack and un unpack the structures all the time yeah and that's where we get this this i guess this um n squared this quadratic um performance performance lost and the more jails we have the more painful that is so i 
yeah, summarize it, I see two things. It's nice as a user to, in, to do the envious things. It does solve the problem, but on a larger infrastructure with a lot of jails, this is we would need to find an alternative um, solution for that. Yeah, I can see what, what Jamie means. We copy the stuff in, we unpack it, store it in our own stuff on the kernel, then someone requests it, so we pack it up again and ship it out over EnvyList. And on the other side, the user does exactly the same thing. And it would be good if we could find a way to work around that. Um, yeah. There is a other side to that story. Uh, we can just store the blob. It's, it's the easiest solution. But uh, one you lose one feature, and that's a partial uh set or get actually you cannot set anything you have to set always the whole blob right so th there is no partial anything and if you just want three attributes sorry no dice you're gonna get the whole thing uh i'm not pro on or con again well for any of those i really want to implement what i started uh do a little measurement and see how it compares to the current times. And if for, I don't know, 100 attributes, we don't really notice the speed bump, then I don't know, let's go with it or something. Mm -hmm. But yeah, let's get to a more concrete uh, implementation details and uh, because uh, everything can be done in the user space for the whatever we call it in the end, ending up calling the, the structure. But analyst alternative can be measured in a user space. So we can see, okay, what if we put thousand elements in and try to filter? Because filtering is the, is the worst. You, you have to traverse the whole structure or find them in a, find elements in a smart way so that you don't traverse the whole list uh, yeah. which I'm trying to do and uh, uh, if you're sending I don't know you have 100 elements and you uh, send okay give me these 100 elements and they don't exist then you have to traverse it all the time uh, till the end and not find them. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it's um, maybe if you uh, error out on first non existing, but yeah, what I'm trying to say is that when we get to the implementation details, we'll get more weird ideas. So, let's not just decide yet. Maybe, maybe we, we can make a better judgment. Yeah, I mean, if we even if we just like phase one, store a blob that happens to be an NV list or whatever that is read only on jail creation, that's already great. And then stage two, um, make it editable so the user can replace this from user land. And then stage three, um, it loves saying blog and not blob, doesn't it? It loves uh, to correct it. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Thank you. Yep. No worries. It's it's got it a whole bunch of times. Um, <laughs> Where was I? Sorry. Um, stage two. Yeah, in stage okay. three. Okay, make it possible to have the kernel understand the data so that it can do sensible things like provide back a subset. Um, I don't know. Okay, um, maybe. On favor, make I should provide a, a bit one at a time because that's. I think that's the lesson from so many other patches is that they spend too long in reviews or bugzilla and not enough time in the tree where people can can use it may Let's i uh, a little bit of interject contact? my observations here uh can you do it in a minute sure. uh, i really want to answer uh this question we already done that uh i sent a few iterations of a patch to to jamie and we already had that the everything is a blob. Now we have uh, now we're storing an envelope, and that envelope can be filtered. So we're already there, 
but we already don't like the solution. So uh, if if you're talking about stages, we're on a third one. Sorry, Jan, go ahead. So um, the problem with sending whole NV lists is that NV lists don't solve the one kind of structure the kernel should understand. The kernel shouldn't inspect the v values you assign to these, let's call them jail variables instead of parameters. Um, the kernel should only store them, make it possible for you to enumerate them. And really, you need a simple CRUD interface. Create, assign a ver variable, uh, read a variable back, remove a variable, get the name of all variables. Okay. That's all the kernel should do, in my opinion. It shouldn't understand the inner structure of the values user space placed there because it's not supposed to be a new cumbersome IPC interface between user space and kernel. It's only, please kernel, store the state for me. At least that's my understanding of what we're going for. Um, so, yeah, and the list isn't really helpful for that because it would only be helpful if we were to move a complex value uh, which the kernel then has to understand and do something with rather than please store this name blob for me. Uh, instead I would see, like to see something uh, like this struct for each uh, variable and then uh, have the jail struct in the kernel uh, have a hat for this, so the rb underscore hat to just that's all you need. The kernel really shouldn't look into this. Jamie, thoughts on yeah, his watch proposal it. there, or that's on. the way I, I see it should work. Yeah, I I would much rather see something simpler, probably just with string values, string name, string value. Yes. Variables have unique C strings as unique per jail as name. So you can't have multi valued variables. And there is no append changes, only replace the whole variable. No patching, no filtering on values, no, nothing, no kind yeah. of smart features. Because all, all of that is replaced by the fact that you have multiple variables, each with their own name. So you do not need to yes. do anything within a variable. And you don't have any form of structure in the names. It's just a flat string. So. Counterpoint from Goran. Arrays. Arrays? Yes, arrays are terrible in that structure. Um, if you delete something, you have to shift the whatever you use as a identifier, or you if you insert something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's yes, no problem because we you want are expected to replace the whole array each time if it's in a single variable. So. You can store as payload a packed NV list. That's fine. The kernel doesn't care. You can also store 16 kilobytes of random data if you want or something. Well, maybe we want a smaller size limit, but still. A, a kilobyte of random stuff as payload. The kernel really shouldn't care. Okay, as it says. Let me finish the structs and then let's discuss why not. Yeah. We won't stop you from scratching any itches. So Godspeed on that. <laughs> uh, Jan, is that a good segue to your updates, other updates? Yeah. So unless someone else wants yeah, to other go topics. first. I know uh, Daniel Bell, you're often short on time. Do you have any topics to bring up? Nothing too exciting. I'm just eavesdropping today. That's okay. We encourage that. And others? 
Let it rip, Jan. So, um, as I mentioned at EuroBSDCon, I've repeatedly seen the problem that lots of subsystems in FreeBSD learn about state, create state, modify state, um, and some other part of the system should respond to state changes. But at least in user space, there is no good way to do that without tightly coupling uh, the event producer with all event uh, receivers. So something like DevD is nice and flexible until you need two uh, different components which have to respond to the same event. Huh. Then you have to write your own custom script and the match capabilities in DevD aren't flexible enough and you can only subscribe to the event once. So basically you can't have two consumers for the same event and both get notified. Instead, you have one consumer for all events and that then has to filter and it's, it's just not uh, automation friendly and leads to hack together systems. So uh, I wanted to get away without a daemon. I tried to do it and it can't be done while matching all the requirements I want to accomplish. The problem is if each state, uh, which can be observed, is uh, represented by a small file in a tempfs or any other file system, to get notified of changes without polling, you have to uh, open a file descriptor. So if someone subscribes to some wildcard pattern and a new state is created, if you can't open the file, your subscription becomes broken because you would have to be able to create a new file descriptor to get state notification changes. And if you can't do that, suddenly you are not notified. So this basically breaks one of the two design goals, design goals I'm going for is um, while creating a new state may fail, notifying an already registered state as changed must never fail. And while connecting to the system and subscribing to new filter patterns uh, may fail, once you're subscribed, you must get all notifications and just through the file system, there is no way, as far as I know, to do that because you have to open a file descriptor for each file you want to learn about with uh, KQ. So it can't be done without any support. Um, okay, so I abandoned this first prototype code because the design was just deeply flawed. And uh, started the second one uh, using a daemon over a Unix socket. Here, basically, states are a unique name and a change timestamp. And because they're just in memory, the timestamps I'm using are, is just host system uptime, which has the nice property that it never goes back and ticks quickly enough. So I can treat the change timestamp as unique. And then I use this struct definition for a state, which is, so states are now indexed by both change time and name. Um, so and the reader position is just the timestamp of the last state the reader has observed. So basically the state in the daemon per connection is really just a socket and um, the read position. And because it's indexed in red black trees, uh, it's a logarithmic search. And to get the next message to send to the reader, it's as simple as find the next node in the tree with a indexed by time with a timestamp greater than the one you've already seen. 
Yeah. So now I have to flesh out a little KQ using daemon to do this and yeah, hopefully next week. I have the daemon and the client library for it and the command line tool. When and you say time yeah. pranker backwards, oh. Sorry. Um, are you sure of that? Sorry. I guess it depends what you measure the time with. Uh, I'm reading the uh, precise host uptime clock. So this clock sh does not go backwards uh, because it's not the wall clock. And right, it's not NTP either. Right, okay, what? it's not. It's not NTP. All right. Yeah, it ticks at uh, whatever speed the internal clock ticks. I don't care about um, the pacing. Yeah, just that yeah. it's a strongly monotonic uptime yeah. counter. Cool. If All the right. system is suspended, I'm fine with this uh, logical clock stopping because mm -hmm. no events are. Notified. Yeah. So, um, and given the timer resolution, I will just not deal with uh, events at the same time and just require the bus to wait until the timer has incremented, which isn't really a performance problem. So basically both the name and the timestamp have to be unique with the special case of a timestamp of really all zeros is special that it's not indexed and so it doesn't collide. That way I can encounter, uh, I can have events which are allocated but not yet notified. Sounds good. And if that's it, welcome Luca. And the next step would be then while a Unix uh, socket using daemon and a client library and a command line tool would work, it's still the problem that you have to have the daemon running to use it, which can be a bit of a chicken and egg problem. So I looked into alternatives and found that um, Netlink sockets are almost a perfect match for this. And we finally have them, and the design is a lot cleaner and better for out than I expected. And yeah. Great. It's a general purpose user space to kernel space and kernel space to user space uh, communication, and potentially also user space to user space with kernel enforced structure. So you can have. Yeah, I would have to implement my own generic Netlink protocol on top of that. On top of that, uh, but the problem is that right now the Netlink implementation in FreeBSD exists, but how to write your own protocols on top of it inside the kernel, so to register my own generic family and stuff like this, is completely undocumented uh, unless you count the kernel code. Great. And given that I really want to use this uh, at the boundary between jails um, and that jails are also the boundary for VNet um, and this is a kind of socket, the whole semantics uh, have to be thoroughly understood to make sure that you're not accidentally exposing state you don't want to expose but still can expose state you want to expose. So yeah, okay. Um, moving it into the kernel through a Netlink socket would be a nice design, but needs some re more research on how to do that correctly. The easier to implement but less clean design would be a pseudo device driver, where the interface between jails, device file system, and uh, user space is better understood and documented but it wouldn't be as nice of an interface to use afterward. Any questions for Jan? Thank you, Jan, and keep up the good work. Yeah, let's, let's uh, a question more. Is this something at some point 
you want to take to the Arch mailing list and go, <laughs> what's the right solution here? Yeah. Because this is a generic problem, isn't it? Not just jail it is. stuff. Yeah. It's relevant for a bit. So potential application would be things like uh, service dependency management. Uh, you would have an event for the service going up, down, uh, being requested up. So basically you would then ha have subscribers and let's, a service could just subscribe to all of its dependencies being up. And if this is signaled, it starts. And that would give you uh, correct parallel startup semantics. Or, yeah, so many other things you could do. And if it's at least also available to the kernel, it would be very useful because it could be a different take on what the DevCTL socket already does. The, the kernel announces things. You could have basically one instance of this namespace where the kernel will report things to be observable. Like there is a network interface, it's up. There's a network interface, it's down. And you would encode this in the label. So you would have one a structure, let's like say, interface slash interface name, and then the slash link, and then the link stays up, down, unknown. And every time an interface goes into this state, uh, this state would then be uh, notified as this has now happened. And uh, so far, I intend to basically reuse the uh, semantics of MQTT when it comes to subscriptions so that you can basically wildcard at a level in the uh, label and levels are separated by slashes and you can only wildcard a full level in the pattern or a, a suffix or both which should be enough to match the patterns you expect to create so basically if you structure your label names correctly, this is a flexible enough query language and very easy to implement fast. With no, okay. no Sounds like you might have language. something next week. Yeah, I hope so. But, oh, we look uh, forward to that. Busy. If there's not anything else, uh, Luca, perhaps you can introduce yourself. I think Dave said, we really need to reach out, reach out to Luca. And I'm glad you made it. You are muted, but you also might be in the middle of something. I was looking for, <laughs> searching for the mute button, sorry. Welcome, no uh, worries. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm Luca. I think I already met at least half of the um, people here. I, uh, in a, more in the past, less, a little bit less, I work on Bot, this RJ framework, uh, that I try to, um, Provide a container way to the uh, to um, how can I say? Try to implement a containerization model or framework um, using FreeBSD. It was um, more an educational project when it started. Uh, basically, the goal was to prove what it was missing at least at a high level. Uh, it went a little bit further. Um, because then a uh, former colleague of mine wrote a driver for Nomad. Uh, Nomad is a container orchestration uh, that has uh, a plugin system where basically you can write your own driver for containers and be able to orchestrate them. So uh, by just implementing the driver, uh, we were able to um, yeah, have a full system, uh, horizontal, horizontally scaling uh, that provides everything. Um, the challenges that basically are outside the, um, say the FreeBSD world or jail specific limitations are jail images. Um, 
that is something that is somehow required when you don't know where your jail is going to uh, basically be executed. So it needs, oh, you're located to that server, so you need to download the image, start the image uh, with some additional uh, details or uh, configuration, and then start it. Uh, everything else, like uh, the direction, you know, ingress, or those kind of uh, high-level concepts were left to uh, the orchestration environment, no matter what with console, and then there was other balancers, so we didn't have to implement anything at that level. Uh, but yeah. So we had, I think the, the biggest challenge was the uh, image definition that we, on purpose, we didn't put a lot of effort. We tried to make something very uh, naive. I said the goal was not to make something very efficient, but just to prove uh, and to see what was missing and what was not. Uh, there is someone even running the solution in production, so it's stable because Ruby is stable, not because the, what we did is still enough, but at least um, it's working. Um, Are you currently working on pot and derivatives, or am I, I don't know, am I hearing a lot of past uh, tense? So basically, um, we commit to do uh, a release every quarter where there is a quarter uh, and I said, oh yeah, we close a couple of uh, patches, we close something um, to keep the moment, uh, at least to keep uh, the project alive. I don't have too much time to work on it. Uh, and the major point is, um, I think it's showing the fact that, um, you know, it's a bunch of shell scripts. So uh, at a certain point you need something that is, needs a programming language to move forward. Um, uh, there are few tricks here and there that we use, uh, but it's um, yeah. The, the the image itself, if you want to manage image with uh, an OCI registry or things like that, shell scripts is obviously not the way to go. Uh, I did some research on how uh, images should work, uh, or at least how the OCI images uh, works. Uh, debate on layers and things like that. Uh, uh, but then uh, they have too much time to work on that. Um, have you seen XC and Jan's work? He gave a talk at your BSD con uh, or BSD can before that. Yeah, uh, I actually was in contact with Michael before. So oh. I tested it uh, already a few, few months ago. Uh, because when we had the same talk, uh, I mean, similar talk uh, uh, last year in, in, in Vienna, uh, then we keep in touch. And um, actually, I think we had similar ideas and he was able to actually to push forward. So uh, very happy to see actually his work going in, in, in a good direction. So, yeah. Despite your best attempts, um, shell check and um, trying to maintain a certain discipline doesn't really uh, make bin sh into a scalable programming language. It's it's not so. Uh... And given the at uh, exchanging jails in some form and installing other people's or other teams' jails is an important functionality users expect coming from Linux containers. We can either adopt the OCI standards and we implement them, or um, basically I would say the package manager already does this. Why can't it just be a meta package? which pulls in, so basically each jail would be its own uh, package repository uh, and would pull in the packages it wants. I'm not sure I follow, um, uh, but the, so container uh, is a application distribution system. Yes. So, uh, and an image is a package, if you can, uh, if you see in this way, you know, kind of, okay, meta, uh, uh, so that's, 
uh, not sure what you mean with make meta packages or. Um, so we have almost ready to use uh, base system packages. Mm -hmm. So basically, the whole user land could be a dependency if you are prepared to package everything you want to have inside a jail. So you could take the normal port packages, the base system packages, and at least one more package for the customization to turn it into a turnkey uh, user land. So a packetized uh, user land. Yeah. What solve this? No, it doesn't solve anything. Uh, you cannot recreate an image at all. If you have a uh, scaling up issue, so you need to scale up, you cannot have five minutes just to recreate an image. The image needs to be recreated in a oh, um, few milliseconds. So the... Um, what? Let him I finish. Put... Let him finish. Yep. So basically, uh, operationally, scale ups should happen in very few seconds. The, the application already needs to start. Uh, additionally, if you only rely on uh, you know existing packages, then it means that you are forcing uh, whoever is developer to write their own application, making the available as a package, and uh, and then you know make the recipe mm -hmm. there. Okay, now install those base, install the packages as a dependency, and then my package that is my application. Um, mm -hmm. It adds up quite a lot and. Um, I would have assumed I would say, that the... I didn't finish. Sounds mm -hmm. like you're wrapping up. Um, Go ahead, Luca. Uh, um, at the beginning, when I started to uh, uh, write on pod, my idea was uh, I don't do any layers. I don't care about layers. You always start from scratch. That was my approach. Simple. Keep it simple. I don't want to have these complications. Uh, turns out that basically it was the first requirements that come from, uh, from users. Um, having to recreate Oh, let's say, uh, I need to change. Oh, I forgot this comma. So I need to recreate the image other 10 minutes, 15 minutes, because you have to restart from scratch all the time. Uh, I, was, I wasn't I was using package base. I was just using uh, the base TXZ. So uh, untarried install packages. So basically the recipe are more or less what you're describing. It's not just using package base, but uh, uh, the, the base system. Um, the process is relatively slow. Um, so that's why when you look at your your the, the users as or the mm -hmm. single developers that needs to pack up things and so on, uh, layers are in that area kind of uh, quite uh, useful because it allows the developers to have a fast rotation. Doesn't mean that in runtime we need to use them, but that's sure, for sure. Uh, that is one thing that um, uh, it turns out to be on high demand. Maybe I'm uh, too uh, comfortable just hacking with FreeBSD specific tools. I would have assumed that basically the, you have this package which then would get on the host would create the user land to be snapshotted using whatever file system, normally ZFS you have. And that if you want to create an instance of that, you would uh, either duplicate the ZFS data set just using a local send receive or cloning it. So that if I need it again, it's a few milliseconds and not the, let's say one or two minutes to uh, install the packages. Yeah, that is a problem that doesn't scale. So, um, for instance, that wasn't for sure a no-go when we uh, wanted to use a, a, an orchestrator. So if you want to use an orchestrator, the problem is you don't know where it's going to land. You want to have probably multiple applications. You have autoscaler that uh, instantiates multiple um, mm -hmm. instances. Uh, so the, the thing is um, the life cycle of the, of the container uh, is not the the, the, is the developer that create the container and the operator, I mean, the, the ops um, is going to execute it. So you have two different people 
teams, yeah. entities in companies that work on, and the containers is the interface uh, where they speak together. Um, so that's why the, the the biggest issue, in my opinion, uh, nowadays with jails is that we still consider, you know, oh, I create the jail in my machine, I will run on my machine. So basically we have everything is, uh, it's okay when you have small team, a person that does everything and that is fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, the, the the success of uh, of containers in general was exactly because they split this workflow. So the container the um, developers create the containers. The creator the containers then goes to the CI, perform all the tests, and then it will be executed and horizontally scaled, whatever, in a completely different environment because uh, it's transparent to to things and. Um, that's why we try to emulate that scenario and having images pushing and pulling images was kind of uh, requirement number one uh, to make this scenario uh, available. Which means you need the extra level of indirection to match the workflow and organizational structure of your users. You have to have something between the build instructions, executing them, and then yeah. this intermediate thing you has to be packageable and shippable. Okay. Yeah. So basically, you have the image. That is the point. But you can create the image, and that means building the image, and then you can run it. So you have the two commas that you need. Uh, that's why also in the OCI specification, you have two specifications, one for the images and one for the runtime. Uh, because mm-hmm. um, and that's exactly um, you split basically the two uh, parts of uh, of things in in uh, yeah. and under the hood obviously you need to start a jail to create it you cannot create it without it but the point is the focus on mm-hmm. the build is I I want to create image so I will have this recipe to bootstrap if you will mm-hmm. if you want and then when you run it you already have something that is ready to run. Um, yeah. Uh, but so, yeah, yeah, basically, I have two workflows uh, to care of. Yeah, and um, so I basically these... co- collapse these two uh, layers in my use case because I have only my own deployment to support, which is uh, quite bespoke. So uh, I can basically have dummy persistent <clears throat> jails for dependency management using <laughs> jail cons and then. This basically creates a jail which is persistent, as only has basically start up and maybe tear down uh, hooks, and creates something which can then be deployed immediately using some kind of file system trickery, either read only ZFS um, or tempfs with uh, MFS, so that I can have some pre-populated tempfs or something. Yeah, but it's not something you can really use as an interface between different groups. And yeah. So it's look ahead. And... But only if you're very comfortable with your own stuff and it's not really an interface. Go ahead, Dave. Expose. It's a look at when you talk about developers um, like needing to update an image how does this actually work from the developer's point of view? Are they writing code on their laptop and then go and get push somewhere and you pick these changes up from Git and then rebuild their system? Or is it, is there work? So, uh, I guess I'm asking, where does this image creation run? Does it run on the developer's environment, laptop or something, or is it in a server infrastructure? So I, I would say that is depend on the, 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 Enterprise you're working in, uh, the kind of how yeah. sophisticated the, the CI uh, uh, you have. Um, I say for typically a, a developer works on his own laptop, so when it and um, uh, so you need something that is able to run locally. Uh, but then mm-hmm. when you make a release, uh, then you have your usually your CI that is going to repack everything. So you have then your image, and then the image goes through the uh, test environment, and then. Uh, okay, new 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 image available, and then it's going to be rolled out by some uh, 
other uh, piece of layer, uh, you know, in, in Kubernetes usually, then you have uh, uh, things like Argo CD or things like that. Basically, oh, they will create a new Helm manifest and then Kubernetes catch up, create a new release process. That yeah. basically we start to deploy the new image compared to the, um, the other ones. Um, but basically, uh, let's say working, having the ability to create images on your own laptop is, uh, is that feature number one, is feature number two, uh, when it comes to uh, having container adopted because um, it solved the, somehow the things that, oh, it's run on my laptop, right? Uh, you have, uh, that's why you have this kind of uh, layer. So you, you start with an image. Um, you don't create the image from scratch. You have the environment. Let's say that you have some complex environment which PHP per the different version, Python, whatever. Okay, yeah, that is my yeah. environment and it's always the same. And then I don't update Python to from 3.9 for 3.10 nightmare. That is reproducible. And then I was going to update the version it's a different, you know, work tree. Oh, now I, I use a new image with Python 3.10 uh, and update the dependencies there. And then I see if my application is still running, but that is the thing. So you have, um, that's why it's, there was the demand of having this kind of uh, layer is because you have one image that is the development environment, you develop your application and you know that you can uh, rely on it. It's reproducible, um, uh, but then, Theoretically, the, the the released image could be built in on on a different system. Mm. So, um... I'm just in the back of my mind, I'm thinking um, two things over the sort of last sort of whatever it is, almost I guess decade now of Docker. Um, the overlay file systems have been a, a continual source of. Um, either performance problems or security problems because it's it's a tricky thing yeah. to deal with and avoiding that is good and my original thinking b before um having you explained this to me at your OBSTCon was it might be sufficient just to have like a zfs data set where every um uh <clears throat> um sort of tagged image is actually just a sha 56 directory with the tarball unpacked into it. And then when someone wants to replace one component of a layer, you only have to pull that piece out, update it, and then reapply the other ones. Um, and then you end up with a, hopefully with a system that isn't slow to build, allows you to rebuild a layer, but ultimately is just shipping directories and tarballs, which avoids the overlay file system stuff. Yeah. But so I can tell you how it uh, works with ZFS. Uh, basically, I read the documentation of how Docker, technically Docker uh, supports ZFS on Linux uh, and how it works. Uh, still, I think there is some limits on the number of layers you can have because then you also have to traverse all of them. Um, but basically what they do, every layer, uh, so they start from the root layer, just extract it and then create a snapshot and then to create a layer on top, they would just clone it, make modifications, new tag, new snapshots, clone it, apply snapshots and so on. So you basically, you can create a, a, a so for every layer you have a, a specific snapshots that depends on all the others. Uh, performance wise are very, I mean, if you reach thousand layers, it is very bad. Um, there are tooling to solve those issues. Um, you can use basically those for, you know, multiple layers to work, uh, because that simplifies uh, the, the day to day life of a developer. But then you can, um, for instance, with Scopio, you can ask, okay, now collapse all the layer. Um, this is the, the release one. I don't need layers when you, when you run application, because re those layers are hardly reusable. And if you strip down the size, um, quite a bit, then you know, 30 megabytes of image, 15 megabytes of image, it is not that much. So uh, it can be, uh, the operation can be still fast and with um, there are tooling basically to allow you to delete, to collapse everything. And so, okay, take all the image, create everything and then one layer only uh, and flatten basically the hierarchy. That is one other solution for that. Uh, and there are tooling that are already doing this. So that's why if you, 
create your own OCI. There, there are a lot of toolings that already went through all those things that, and there is a, a package for Scorpio, so you can already using, uh, uh, there is already uh, on FreeBSD, so there is some, so I already start to work on, on this direction to, um, to have the same tooling and uh, using the same experience there. Do you have links yeah. to any of those? What, what I'm mindful of is that that um, the, the the Podman suite, which is what where the OCI tooling comes from, that um, that Doug Rebs imported, is awesome, but it's enormous, and the Docker world is quite idiosyncratic and moves very very quickly, and then we become beholden to something that's outside of our source tree in an environment that doesn't have any interest in supporting um, BSDs. Um, and that's that that's kind of the trade-off. Uh, is it better to have something that is specific to FreeBSD and provide a way to translate stuff, you know, um, between um, sort of Docker world and um, FreeBSD world? Or is it better to try and keep up to date with the upstream and hope that that continues to work. Mm. It's a it's it's a good question. I don't have an answer, but I can. No, no, tell I. You basically, <laughs> no, no, I, I can tell you. Why don't you have an answer, Luca? Why not? Why? <laughs> I can tell you basically <laughs> what I, yeah, what, what I learned. I mean, before we were talking also with Jan, you know, of the fact that you have two workflow, one for the the ops and one for the developers. Uh, yeah. If you care only on one of the workflow. Uh, you would not basically reach the same uh, adoption, and that is, you know, it's the question is, do we care? If we want to reach a, a larger adoption, or uh, no, we only do our thing, but it's just for us, so we don't care. Uh, obviously, we are not a company, so uh, if you have to have a company, oh no, you know, you have to study your users, see see what they want, and so on. Um, it's not wrong or or correct. The, the thing is, uh, uh, if you only care on, let's say, on the runtime. Uh, but the developer experience is poor, well, there'll be no developers that will be happy to use it. Uh, and that is actually the struggle uh, that people, when you people, um, uh, Rainbow that has this uh, implementation uh, in, in prod, it says, okay, now the developers won't develop their stuff on their laptop. And that means, oh, we need to have some sort of Docker machine, something, you know, the run, oh, you need a, 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 a FreeBSD virtual machine and then something that interacts with that to have your jail running there because they need to be able to work on, on something that is as close as possible to, to production. So if they, you know, work on Docker and then, yeah, this is a Docker file running on FreeBSD, it doesn't work, right? So, um, yeah. uh, so if you care only on, uh, let's say on one layer, well, you're missing one part of the equation and uh, it means that adoption can be limited. You can do, you have more freedom because then you can do whatever you want and you can uh, use better what FreeBSD uh, can provide. Um, so you're not a technology follower, uh, but. Yeah, I think the expectation when I talk to people who are not FreeBSD developers is they go, yeah, we need Docker. What I want to be able to do is go, uh, Docker pull Redis and have it work. And th the problem is that will never work consistently to the point where you would run a business on it. There will always be Linuxisms. There will be things that assume that they will run as PID1 in a container, um, that some sort of system D infrastructure will be present, all of that. And that for me is the fundamental question under underlying all of this is I understand the workflow and the need to support developers and um end users or developers and operations people as well. Um, but the if you want Linux, then use Linux and that's fine. I'm a FreeBSD person. I'm very pragmatic. Um, if it's the better tool for the job, then you should use it. But as a FreeBSD zealot on the inside in my own infrastructure, um, I would like the ability to build containers and fetch them. Um, it doesn't need to be from an official container registry and I don't really care what's inside the image format. Um, yeah, it's great to see the OCI image format is outside the, the Dockerverse, which it wasn't in the beginning. Um, and I think that's, at least that's one part that's quite quite stable. We can pull and push from that. Um, but our FreeBSD world has traditionally been um, ports, packages, and people building stuff on top of that in their own infrastructure. I don't know I how much you, yeah. you would get. I, 
I can tell you a secret. Uh, every time you run, uh, I mean, nowadays developers care only on their development platform. They don't care about infrastructure. So if you ask them, do you want Kubernetes or Nomad or whatever orchestrator, they will say, I don't care. I need my VS code to, to run my stuff. And then it's not my problem where it's going to run. I need to write some hell to, yeah, cool. I have to run some, no, they honestly don't care. Uh, they don't even see the operating system they are running on. Um, no. It's the operations that decide what to use. As long as the interface is container. Okay, I have my container, I can create my container, I can test it, I can develop on my machine, and then it's your business how to run it, where to run it. And that is, nowadays, it's really, the, the operating system is way more abstracted for, for developers. Not obviously everyone, there are developers that have to go uh, down to um, to the beast, but many developers, you know, things that are, you just imagine JavaScript people, Python, whatever, they honestly uh, give me something, that's it. Um, so actually, mm -hmm. if you provide a similar, but the, the point is they are used to that um, experience. I need a Redis instance to connect my, my web application. Well, come on, I have Redis. I don't need to, I, they don't install Redis natively. They just run a container on Redis because uh, if they then put a tag, it's more reproducible once the application yeah. needs to be shipped. Um, um, and that is one of the limits, for instance, on using pack, uh, the port tree. I mean, I'm I'm a port manager, so uh, the, the thing is, uh, if you need to be stick to a specific version because of your needs, then it actually is a problem uh, with PGP because, oh, oh, new version, boom, shipped. And then um, could be sometimes a, a problem. So um, Yeah, and the, and the way we've dealt with that traditionally in FreeBSD is, oh, you just fork the ports tree and you update it when you want and you keep a particular port back. Is, am I using the word just there and it's most <laughs> uh, did you just tell me to go screw yourself well I certainly did yeah it's not that yeah and we're quite used to that we've got so many scars from it, it to us it feels quite normal but yeah um, we digress but I think that's a, that's a really good point yeah what's the experience um, what is the problem we're trying to fix users don't care or well, developers don't care what they want is to be able to run stuff locally and when they're ready have the last little bit of their secret source put in the container and they don't really care how that works. But yeah. the problem is with what I've seen is possible with the tools in FreeBSD, either you have to consume what the project gives you or you have to run it all, run your own base system, install image builders, your um, yeah. own package repositories and so on. And basically, this means you have to get a nice dual socket to you server running half a day just to build uh, packages every night. Um, okay. If you want, really okay. want a full pod tree for even one or two uh, releases so that everything is at your tips. You mean not every user wants to have their own build cluster? Seriously? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. Uh, you, not everyone wants to be, be a FreeBSD uh, release engineer, uh, at least part-time. And right now, that's basically what you have to do to get most of this flexibility. You can't yeah. just do what tools like uh, Synth try to use the official packages and only take what's different. And something like that is what users probably, if they knew what to ask for, would be the same reasonable interface that you could mix and match. And for that to be as fast to deploy as a true container deployment under Nomad or some other orchestrator, uh, depends you would have to be able to basically keep a local ca warmed up cache, which is not just a hit miss cache, but a partial synced mirror of the official resources you're depending on so that you can rely on it to be fast. Not just, oh, I fetch via HTTP and run everything through Squid or I've configured Varnish uh, as a 
powered cache by doing uh, dark things on my network. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dan and Dan, as production users, I would love to hear your just take on what we get right and are definitely missing and you'd like to see trickle in from, say, if we've lost a Dan. So we've lost one or two, but we one will do. <laughs> Dan, any observations? You're talking about, you're talking about container type stuff? Yes. Uh, ecosystems and just, yeah. you know, what... I, I've, been, Go ahead. I've been concentrating on some system upgrades. Uh, I realize the need for container type stuff. There's a lot of demand for it. I personally, I'm not sold on that approach because I'm not using it. I'm using mostly jails, but I don't think what I'm doing or not doing should count towards any decisions. But yeah, there's a demand and I think it would be used. I think it would be used heavily. So I think where I got lost and tried to convince you to get uh, to follow me uh, down the wrong way is that what we have are lots of good usable tools to build a local jail. That's uh, basically the tooling is there. You just have to deploy it. The things probably everyone here has done, which is write some kind of automation to create a local jail for a specific deployment. But for the workload Luca is describing, uh, the, the workflow Luca is describing, basically you have to take this and make it shippable so that you build the user land. And then once you have it, you don't just have to be able to run it locally. You have to be able to, if possible, bit by bit identically ship it so that you have it reproducible across different jail hosts. Even if there are some differences between the hosts. Yeah, that is basically the I say the container world was it became mm -hmm. uh, when you have orchestrator where you just say, okay, you describe your service and then, you know, if you describe your service, okay, my, my web application has CHP server and then, you know, you spend some time to uh, configure your container with your PHP and then, oh, I have also need a Redis and then you need a mem and then mm -hmm. basically you package everything. Okay, my application is not a, not a program, it's actually a piece of infrastructure and that is okay. That is how I ship it and uh, then they scale horizontally. So every time I need something more, you have a load balancer in front and then more mm -hmm. traffic is going to um, auto scaling and blah, 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 blah. And that is basically uh, how, let's say, uh, large companies uh, nowadays uh, structure their, uh, their application under the hood. Uh, I'm not saying that is, you know, uh, but... wrong or, cor <laughs> or correct. It's, it's not wrong. It's just it how it a is. real world uh, requirement for them. Yeah, but I mean, that is how they solve the problem. However, uh, at least. you do it, if you do it on a per file level, so basically FreeBSD package installs aren't much slower if you have a fast package mirror, not some CDN mirror on a different continent, then fetching and uh, unpacking a tarball. So basically fetching the file system tar image and unpacking the tar file into a local file system. That's the slow part for big systems. It will always take more than you want to wait to basically populate an empty file system from a tarball. If you have a two gigabyte user land and a one gigabyte application and, a f and some assets you have to copy over. And this if you are unlucky, the, the application has lots of tiny files, so you have to do lots of open, write, close sync kind of loops. And the only way to really get to the deployment time down to below 10 seconds is to not do operations on single files. So you can't really materialize from a tarball into a normal file system. Either you have to do it at runtime with something like a union file system, 
to basically never really materialize these overlays into a single normal file system, or you have to um, materialize it once and keep this cached. And if you create a new instance, you have the slow single file unpacking stuff already done and have a on FreeBSD in a production deployment ZFS snapshot, you can then take clone as a read only clone and uh, recreate only the mutable part. But what I found is that this can not in a well automated way, but in a theoretical way be used to um, build this out and mount it in together because as long as you basically have the base system and your application and this is stateless and you only want to combine it with dedicated stateful preserved what docker calls volumes that can be done but what can't really be done is this nesting this patching a single file somewhere or re especially removing one without mounting a full file system on top of something. Basically, this patching instead of just replacing subtrees. Replacing subtrees we can do. And given the FreeBSD file system hierarchy, that's enough for a lot of things, but not universal enough that it makes for a good interface for a container uh, tool chain. I think the trick is to split this large problem up into a bunch of smaller ones. We have some usability things, which is fetch, fetch a container, push a container, publish a container. We have some internal plumbing, which users directly don't care about, which is how we do that efficiently. And um, we have some other pieces around what is the format to describe and manipulate these. And then finally, um, if I have all of those things, how can I stack them together so that I have um, the middleware, the database, and the, I don't know, the cache, um, all sort of bundled in, into one description piece. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the trick, yeah. isn't it? How Basically, to, how to... Uh, because we use ZFS, I mean, both is based on ZFS. Uh, our trick was, you know, an image is a dump of uh, a data set. And then, I mean, and then we put some metadata in the file name because I would say it was very naive as implementation. So it's basically just that. Uh, and then, okay, there is a machine doesn't have this image, needs to fetch it, fetch, mm -hmm. untar, uh, and then you create a snatch and then the image will stay there. Everyone you just Everyone now make... getting the alert? Sorry? Sorry. No, I got my phone turned off. off. I had mine turned on, so I get it. Oh, I need it for the thing. Sorry to interrupt you. Please continue. I got it too. Yep. Fetch, Antar. Uh, basically, then when you have a snapshot, you just clone it and then you create a. Uh, because that is the thing. The image is like a class, while the container is like an object. So it's an instance of an image. And basically, we keep, you keep the, the, the a ZFS snapshot that is the image and then. You clone it to create a new container. The container disappear. You destroy the clone, but you keep the snapshot. So it's it, then when you create a new one, that was pretty easy. Um, and I think there is a similar because then uh, uh, Grembo implemented the, the layer things that basically then it keep multiple um, snapshots and, and things like that. But it's basically um, uh, what you have there. Uh, we use ZFS, and we instead of using overlay or whatever. You snapshots clone, you modify that, snapshots clone, modify that. We don't go up to, you know, too many layers, but it is basically what we did. And then locally, um, you need to download all the needed uh, layers to rebuild everything. And that is so there. the requirement for that is um, this, from your perspective, this is fast enough for people with the caveat that if you want to edit the middle layer, the middle ZFS snapshot in this chain, then you won't be doing that on the developer's machine and it will take a bit longer because you've got to unstitch the package. But most of the changes that people want to make are in the top two layers anyway. 
exactly. Yeah. So basically, yeah. How, how it works, just imagine that uh, uh, I'm writing a C++ application, you know, on and then uh, someone uh, in a large application, someone else is maintaining the developer image. And then maybe for six months and a year, there is no changes in that. Uh, uh, and the similar things, it just just imagine that you have a FreeBSD 13.2, that is the image. And then uh, if you have, uh, and then someone else, okay, there is, there is the PHP 8.0, and someone is carrying on the, the requirements. So basically the dependency that needs to be there and then I write my PHP code and then I put it there and it's working. Uh, and then someone says, oh, we need to actually update. Okay, we need to update. You know, I have my code. I would just rebase my stuff to to new to use the new one uh, and then see if it's working again. I have my test and then, okay, I will rebase with the new one and go for it. Um, at least this as um, This is the mental layer. You know, kind of uh, you develop your application on top of something that is already stable, and then if you need to uh, update your dependency, you only work on the lower layer, um, and you keep the application stable uh, as form of regression. Instead, if you need to work on the uh, on the on the application, you want to keep the dependency layer stable. Jamie, any thoughts on container and ecosystems? No, I really haven't um, done anything with that for many years. Uh, used to have something that I did myself along the lines of a uh, overlay file system, but uh, that was only ever you know outside the FreeBSD kernel. It was only private work, but it's it's years old, and so I haven't done anything since since I was employed doing such things back in the day. Understood. Let's see. Goran, any thoughts? You've been quiet in this conversation. Well, basically, Luca covered it. Excellent. I mean, it depends how you look at it. I personally have one pile of trails, let's say. But I can totally see how people want images. I I personally don't, and and it's cool if we support both. Then we're we're right in the middle. It's a shame Jan isn't here. At my, Jan Michael with XC. It is is he truly making the most of OCI images, and they are largely unmodified. And have a nice day. Yes. Um... Yeah, basically, um, he wrote something that creates uh, OCI images. Basically, he, he used public OCI registry. So that's the point. Instead of having a, a mirror, you can use something, uh, uh, the Docker Hub, for instance, or yeah. uh, some local registry like, uh, I think he tested the Azure one because you have credits. Um, but basically, yeah. Uh, those kind of layers. At the end, the layers are not that complicated. There are some sort of tarball um, with one special command to say, okay, delete this file or delete this, clean up this folder before extracting it. Uh, so you cannot really just use tar uh, to do it, uh, but it's not, let's say, so. Uh, there is no, no magic. Uh, uh, it's not rocket science. It's in this okay. region. So it uh, started out as Go code, uh, which just invoked GNU tar and did a bunch of modifications on the result. No, actually, you have beginning. to act. Bef you need to act at the beginning exactly. So you need uh, before yeah. to untar. You need to know which file you need to delete, because that that is the the naive thing of uh, the OCI images. The layers layers are only additive. Um, and if you want to delete something, yes, you can, but then you still have to download the files first and then delete it in the layer in, in the following layer. So that is what the I stupid is thing. That it started out as Go appli uh, applications yep. calling command line tools to create this and not and basically 
interpreting it as a script, what to do, instead of them really doing it directly because that would have been harder. So the format isn't as complex as some other things in the container world. Dave, it sounds like you're out the door. Do you have a moment or we talk about this next time? Where yeah, I, I do. But I think two do. things is some Maybe. homework for people to do. Um, so oh, just a recap for everyone who wasn't in the same places all the time. This is um, yeah. a summary of the last, whatever it is, all the meetings since the beginning of the year. Every time someone said, I want a thing, this wow. thing is in here, I hope. Um and what we agreed the last um, time is that we would go through this and people would go, I want that, or I'm prepared to work on it, or maybe I'm prepared to pay for someone else to work on it. It doesn't really matter. There's a column on the right. If you can zoom in a little bit, like to page width or something, yeah, then we can see the other column. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. Let me zoom out. Right. Uh, and I don't want to change the subject, but I know Dave has to run. So then it looks like okay, so you yeah, mentioned. Make it a little bit smaller and drive up. So okay. make it like 100% and we should see everything. Or 90. Sure. And go. I yeah. posted the link if you want to open it up. Yeah. If you zip up to the top, uh, yeah. right up to the top of the page. Um, yeah. So we got the proposer. If you know, if you are the proposer, you can fill your name in. Because from the notes that um, we don't have, it's not always clear. Yep. I need to group these areas, which I'll do over the next um, next few days. Want as you want it, and people as just random. If there was someone who was mentioned, um, for example, non root jails, um, Edward already did some work in that area, so I put the name in. Right. Um, but the goal here is to do two things find out what people are interested in doing um, and what people want, and then order them by the number of people who said yes, and then take these in small chunks off to the jails list to get some wider feedback. Um, and then bundle them up with um, um, people who want to work on them and people who are prepared to to contribute to that. Um, so we have some people, have, some companies have expressed interest in certain features, and um, what we want is to try and build something that allows all of the jail manager tools to build to move forward and to build on that um, instead of having everyone do all the work, um, pick the pieces that are worth having and keep them together. So. For example, in this list, there's we want a jail demon. Um, that's very unclear what this jail demon should do, um, but everyone would like something like that. So what we need to do is get wider feedback on that particular item, come back with a list, um, and then figure out how we can deliver that in small, discrete chunks that everyone can use Yeah, as a wider example. Um, anyway, so in summary, read the list, put your name on stuff, on all the columns that make sense. Um, if something's missing, edit. And I can't emphasize enough that this was a blank document at the start of the week. So great work, Dave. That's <laughs> it, was, it wasn't nearly as bad as I thought. Um, there's a lot of reading. I've refreshed all the minutes that you spent so much time on, Michael. So that's really um, good. I'm impressed. Okay. Crazy man. Go ahead. Yeah, Jim, any questions? Briefly. Regarding the um, TARFS, TARFS is only in 14 and um, yeah. TAR is... Uh, a really uh, bad on disk format. So can we, hang on a second. Can uh, we just go back to the topic at hand? Yeah. yeah. Is, there, are there any comments on on the spreadsheet before we move off from that? I think it's very good. Um, so one com comment. Sorry, yeah. When you go. and how are you going to uh, use the entered data? Um, my plan is after the first after next week we can take the top prioritized ones and talk about one or two of those things and then i'll farm them off onto the jails mailing list and open it up for wider discussion and just do them in small chunks until there's no chunks left sounds good well fantastic work there everyone take a look at that that's yeah not a a, a... We, we don't want to step through any of them right here and now, but that's it. No, we don't. <laughs> no, we don't. Uh, and I'll say yeah. super quickly, uh, you're, uh, speaking of you, Dave, uh, your talk is up for your Euro-based econ and Jans, who spoke about XC, so those are very much on topic. And my talk is up, but a better audio version is coming. 
Related to that, I've been working extensively to refactor uh, my work. There's a link in the document. And Jan, you have a brief word about uh, TARFS? Just, uh, while TARFS is really neat and a useful little tool, uh, it's not suitable uh, as a tool, for example, to mount your um, jail user land completely using it because it's just really slow because it's just a stream on disk of a header or maybe more than one header and then the file content and the next header so it's just oh, totally a, yeah. it's like the most so, inappropriate format for this exactly. but, <laughs> but uh, what it illustrates is the ease of use of having a single yes. thing that you fetch and stall and run and that's the really the key mm -hmm. point here um I'm sure that Tarifis will get faster because um, people are working on it. Um, yeah. So, what? But is uh, it is it once once it does the VNode caching stuff? Is it significantly slower after the first run? Once it, you have a, the uh, index for a file cached, it's fast. Yeah. Um, it's the finding the uh, the basically the uh, inode on the stream that's slow. Yeah, it's, it's a needle in a haystack stuff each yeah, time but for every single what file. Is every block. Already available uh, and has been for eternity is to just take a UFS file system with uh, yeah. and instead of using tar to create the image, use mkfs, create your um, uh, makefs to create your uh, optimally packed UFS file system and you get really good disk layout for your image. The only downside is that you have to create the uh, read-only MD device to mount it. The big distant difference here, though, is is that every Unix system and most Windows systems ship with tar. So you have this thing where anybody can build the tar ball. And this circles back to where I really like TarFS was oh. it's not complicated. It works, and it doesn't require installing a FreeBSD-specific tool set on someone's computer. Yeah. Um, but MKFS is probably pretty portable now. Um, MKFS and Restore. MKFS, yeah, exactly. You said Restore. Because um, you can use Restore, the okay. uh, old the the um, inverse of dump uh, for uh, UFS to restore the image content to any file system. So you can even mm -hmm. use the UFS image as an exchange format if you want to on FreeBSD. By just restoring it into a freshly created ZFS data set. Um, yeah. Yeah. Th oh. th this comes back to user experience. And um, it's just. Yeah. There's, there's some more thoughts here. So I've got to run. Okay. Um, several do. So any other you, last Luca? thoughts or shall we wrap it up? Thank you so, so much, uh, Luca and Garan and Dave for your work. All the flies on the walls. Okay. You're on. Take care. Okay, well, let's officially call it there and I can stick around a few minutes. Yeah. So, um, Jamie? Oh, you just left. Oh. Yeah. Um, so I found out that NetMap, while not well documented on FreeBSD and kind of implicitly assumed on Linux in a lot of places is really a well-designed uh, interface. And for all of these things involving user space to kernel communication, it's almost always a good answer. Interesting. And what's using it thoroughly at in this point? In FreeBSD? So uh, for compatibility reasons and maybe nice features going forward, uh, it can be used for the, most things you would use iOctals right now in the networking stack. So configuring network interfaces. One of the basically um, milestones was when the Linux IP2 command in a Linux jail worked to manage the network stack. Because FreeBSD just accepted the same messages as the hmm. Linux kernel. Nice. Okay. Very so cool. So that you can use the Linux uh, IP2 command and a VNet enabled Linux jail to configure the network stack of the jail. 
Um, the other thing is, it's extend. It's an extensible Sorry, yeah. protocol. While you're at it, it's also for routing. It, so, yes. The so the whole so, the whole plethora of Linux networking tool suddenly works. Yeah. So a lot of advanced networking tools will become a lot easier to port now. For example, the BERT routing daemon has an optional flavor for the port of using Netlink on FreeBSD, which just uh, also enabled uh, multi-path routing support. Because before that, I think they didn't have it in the release and only as a patch for FreeBSD, stuff like that. But for oh. all the things relevant in this talk about adding new features to FreeBSD, the important part is that you can have your own dynamically loaded protocols on top of um, Netlink, so called Netlink generic. There has to be some code in the kernel to register this generic protocol, and then you can look it up by name. Uh, if anyone wants to play with it, there is a kernel module to, to in FreeBSD 14 to make devctl events available via Netlink which has a nice um, benefit that you can uh, have multiple subscribers now instead of just one dev D. Oh, do you know who's driving this work? Uh, you, I would have to do a git blame. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at um, being, adding, a, there's a patch in uh, the fabricator to add... Um, a command on the Netlink interface to just uh, inject messages from user land. Huh. So um, Christoph has used it for the DCO stuff, I think. Uh, so let's check who's working on all of this. Well, Malifaro, yeah. I would expect as he implemented the, the Netlink would have something to do with it. And who is that? Let me write it. It's going to be easy. Oh, there you go. Yes, thank you. Yeah, oh. Alexander Chernikov and Christoph. Um, all those, I think, did a bunch of stuff for, with it. Yeah. I didn't want to turn it into full email addresses. Right. Well, cool. Thank you for that update. That's That's like progress that looks like it'll have some nice side benefits to pretty much all of this. Anything else? Yeah. So um I'll take that as a good for now. Um good for now, yeah. Great. Then thank you, everyone. I will stop the recording, and I wish you a fantastic rest of the week. A few of us will join in a few hours for OpenZFS. Take care. Bye-bye.